in Psalm 20. It's a great little psalm. It has to deal with really before the war, and Psalm 21 has to deal with after the war. Just a quick little psalm tonight, and we'll get right back into, you know, praying for people, but we just want to put the word in here in a very wonderful way. It's a psalm of David. He wrote Psalm 20 and 21. And like I mentioned to you, it's a, it's a national prayer for a day of war. And boy, I tell you, I don't know what to say. I mean, I remember when I was a kid, we had to get underneath the chairs. Some of you aren't that old, but some of you are. You know, get under the chair. Well, why, Steve? Because the atomic bomb was coming. You know, and we were so afraid. Nixon was able, I mean, Kennedy was able to turn it but before it happened in Cuba. But it is absolutely frightening. When you think of, you know, the suitcase bombs, you think of Pakistan, you think of these countries, why are we over there? There's only one reason. Mainly for the oil, of course, but to get the bombs. I mean, to make sure that no one else gets them. Well, how do you know Iran doesn't have it? Well, I guarantee you, if Iran had it, they'd use it. So that's the only reason that they haven't used it. And those of you that are so afraid, don't worry about Israel. Israel will not be bombed. Well, how do you know that? Because the prophecy is that the Antichrist is going to occupy Israel one day. So Satan is not going to allow that place to be bombed because it's going to be his headquarters. So one of the great things is that the United States is going to turn on Israel. We know that. We have. And uh, it's a tragic thing. No one has ever done what we have done in our country. And the Bible says so crystal clear that whoever turns on Israel is destroyed. Every nation, Britain, every nation, the Philistines, the Canaanites, the Amorites, uh, everything else has turned on Israel has perished. And so for all these years and all the things we've done wrong is the one thing we have done right is we've given a lot of money in the mission fields. We are a country that has given. There's no doubt about that. And we have supported missions like no other country ever has. But now, the moment we pulled back from Israel, everything started to come undone. 9-11, all the way to everything now, you know, losing what we have financially, losing the grade that we had, now losing it again, you know, and it won't take much. I know, I know it's hard to believe that, and I know that you've always had a buck in your pocket, but if China and Russia decides to fold up on the $1 bill, overnight, we're done. That's how critical, critical it really is. So what are we going to do? You can't do anything except pray. And so, well, what about, you know, we need gold. You don't have money to buy gold. It says that you're going to have all the money. It's going to take a loaf of bread. So I don't know how far we're going to go, but I didn't think we'd go this far. And when people do rise up and we get upset because the FCC is going to make changes, then we put them back down. We put them back in their place. But again, let me tell you, it's only for a moment. In other words, they rise up, they want to have a say, they want to put something in all the studios and the churches, but then we're, we push back really strong because of the First Amendment. But that's only for a moment because the thing that is holding everything together is the church of Jesus Christ. He that hinders will hinder till he be taken out of the way. The moment the Lord takes us out of here, chaos and lawlessness is going to happen. And then Satan's going to set it up. So we realize that we're not the country. And even the Republicans and Democrats, they're both anti-God. So this is the first time that they have lost credibility. We've lost heart. And we just see the country going down. But if people are desperate and they cry out, God can do it one more time. And when God does a revival... It's really going to be a Reformation revival. It will happen like it did in the days of Welsh, if this is what God wants. But let me tell you how you're going to know. It's not going to be inside the church. It's when all of a sudden the NFL shuts TV down because people don't want to watch it. They want to go to church. <laughs> Are you kidding me? No. Well, then we don't have it. Right. You see, the football game's more important than the Word of God. I know you don't want to hear that, but it's true. And 
The Emmys are really more important than church. But what do you get at the Emmys? What you wear? You can't afford it. You going to look like them? I don't think so. And so all of a sudden, you begin to realize you're in trouble, and I'm in trouble. So what are we going to do? Well, if you and I would begin to pray like we are being taught, and we bow our knee before God, I believe that those families are going to explode. I believe those single lives are going to take off. I believe those who have are going to have more. I believe that God is going to do things like you've never seen before. This is the greatest moment to live in right now. And that's what God has to change your heart. You can't look at this as horrible times. These are the most critical times in our world. And yet, God is saying to me, it's time for you to speak up. Well, that's what's happening. You know, believe it or not, that's why we need to pray. That's why I need your prayer. You can't be afraid. You have to make a stand. And I'm willing to do it. I mean, I am willing to give it all up for this one moment. Because I can't go back. You know, someone has to do it. And um, what have I taught you all of my life for 33 years? You've got to make a stand. So if I got on television, and all of a sudden he starts talking about what I don't want to talk about, I have to do it. Otherwise, I have failed you and God. So I believe that when you open your mouth, God's going to speak through it. Well, in Psalm 20, this is before the war, great Psalm. He says here, the Lord hear thee in the day of trouble. The name of the God of Jacob defend thee. Now, if all the people in the world, would you put Jacob there? He's the last one I would put there. I'd put the God of Abraham or the God of Isaac, but not the God of Jacob. Jacob was a conniving cheat. He was a thief. He ripped off Laban. He took from Esau the birthright. He lied, you know, he sold Esau, he'd be right there. He had no business being there. He wasn't going to go. And so Esau really came after Jacob, and Jacob really had a tough time. But he cheated, he lied, he deceived mom and dad. I mean, everything about Jacob is like, God, why would you choose Jacob? Well, why would God choose David? How can David have a heart after God when David committed adultery and murder? And how could he get Uriah drunk and even have peace in his own heart? But it was what these guys did. And by the way, when God took Jacob, it really opened a door for me because you're kind of cheats and you kind of don't always tell the truth. And I don't. And what is God doing in our life? We are trying to seek to do what's right. But when God says he's the God of Jacob, what I want to share with you tonight, it gives you tremendous hope. It's like... You know, my wife, my, my daughter listened, read my book, and she was listening to the tapes, and she says, oh, I'm in, that church, I'm in that chapter that the four bad Jesus girls got okay. I'm thinking, wait, wait, wait. I didn't name no chapter that. And then I finally figured out what she was saying. That was her language to say. That's when Rahab, the harlot, and Tamar, she was also a prostitute, you remember, and Ruth, the Moabite, were all in the genealogy, and they all brought forth Christ. So... God uses people who are devastated. God uses people that are just ready to give up. That's the people that God comes after. So when you look at a church, it's a hospital. God doesn't want you to stay where you're at. He wants you to worship him. But he also wants you to know that with the love that he took Jacob, with the love that he went after Ephraim, with the forgiveness that he gave to Manasseh, he's willing to do for you and I. And sometimes we don't see that. He says here, the Lord hear thee in the day of trouble. The name of God of Jacob defend thee. Send thee help from the sanctuary and strengthen thee out of Zion. Two things I need. I need the sanctuary of God. David said, oh, I wish I could be there. David loved the sanctuary. He, I think he would have given up being a king to be a priest if he could. And then notice, God, send your strength. Where does it come from? It comes from the sanctuary. Where does the anointing come from? It comes from God himself. It comes from the water that comes underneath of the door that flows by the side of the altar that grabs you by the ankles and grabs you by the knees and grabs you by the waist, and God begins to get a hold of your life. But it comes from underneath the door of the temple. 
All the blessings of God come there. So my strength comes from hearing the Word of God. My heart comes from listening to the things of worship. And my strength will come from this place too. So it is the Word of God that strengthens my heart in a wonderful way. Remember all thy offering and accept thy burnt offerings and thy sacrifice. And this is that burnt offering. It was the only thing that it was an acceptable sacrifice. In other words, you didn't have to do a burnt offering. You didn't. It was a consecration offering. We don't talk about that word. We talk about sanctification. That's the work of the Spirit. We talk about justification. That's when God has forgiven you and forgiven all that you've done, just as if I've never done it. But the word consecrated means this. If you love God with all your heart, and if God has been good to you, and you would like to tell God that, then you would bring a consecrated offering to God. You would cut it up, you and the priest, you place it up on the altar. They would light the thing on fire. You would step back. The priest and you would receive nothing. God took the whole thing. The fat, the meat, everything, God consumed it. Why this is so important is because all the other offerings the priest was able to take. They would give God the fat. The, the priest would get the Chateaubriand, the filet mignon. That'd be cool. But this one offering, you would lay it up, and you would praise God and saying, God, I don't need anything. I just want to say, this is how much I love you. Now, you are to be a burnt offering to God. It says in Romans chapter 12 that we are to offer ourselves a living sacrifice. But the one thing you have to do is you have to take off your tennis shoes. Because once you hop up, you can't be jumping down. And you can't jump off of it. You have to stay there. That's why when we talk about Abraham and Isaac, we believe Isaac was 30-some years old. He carried the wood all the way up. He said that we have the wood and we have the fire. Where's the sacrifice? And Abraham said God will provide himself a sacrifice. But eventually, God had to speak to Abraham, to speak to Isaac and say, Son, you need to be the sacrifice. So at 33, he was a willing sacrifice, Isaac. He was a type of Christ. And he goes on to declare here, Remember all the offering and accept thy burnt offerings. So the things that I have to do, things I want to do. Grant thee according to thy own heart, and fulfill all thy counsel. Have you been asking God for something special? Have you been asking God to do a work? Well, let me tell you, he's going to do it. Just be patient. Just be patient. It might take a little bit of time, but God will do it. He put it in your heart. Maybe you've been praying for your spouse, or maybe you've been asking God to bless you financially. You wait. God is going to do it in a wonderful way. Now know, verse 6, now know I, the Lord saves his anointed. He will hear from his holy heaven with the saving strength of his right hand. I thank God for this one verse for me because God has made me the pastor here, and through all my sickness, this verse God gave me. Now I, that the Lord save his anointing, anointed. He will hear him from his holy heaven with the saving strength of his right hand. Some trust in chariots, some in horses, but we will remember the name of the Lord our God. So we can trust in chariots, but again, there are hunks of iron. That's why some people said, well, we have to fight, you know, in the valley because that's where God really works. Well, no, he's the God of the valley. He's the God of the mountain. So just because Ben-Hadad said one thing, God says, well, now we're going to prove Ben-Hadad wrong. We're going to show him who God really is. So all of a sudden, God uses you to prove him wrong. So we can fight the battle in the mountain. We can fight the battle down below. Now remember, the chariots were frightening. They had all kinds of crazy things that would cut you in half. They would run over you. Lamentation tells us, and Jeremiah said that they ran over the old men. They just destroyed the people of God because they didn't have horses. God did not allow Israel to have horses. So why did Solomon have it? He was disobedient to God. Sometimes David cut the hamstring out of the back of the horse, and he used them just to ride around. They were not to have horses. They were not to have an instrument of strength. They were not to show strength over anybody. God was to be their strength. And yet we kind of say, well, we cut the tendon, we did this, we did that. You know, that's not right. 
So we have to get to a point where we're not going to trust in that chariot. Yes, it can go further. But let me give you a scripture. If you're tired running with the footman, what happens when the Jericho overflows? And if you're tired, once again, of running, what happens when the chariots come? So either way, you can't be tired now. Well, Steve, I'm really exhausted. You can't because the time's coming that the Jordan's going to overflow. The chariot's going to come. But the Bible says of Elijah, he outran the horses of Ahab. You remember that? In 1 Kings chapter 18, it says, come down, Ahab, the rains are coming. And the Bible says he ran ahead of the horses of Ahab. So in the spirit, he outran the horses. That's pretty quick. That's where God wants you and I. He wants us in front of the horses. He wants us in front of the world. He does not want us copying the world. He wants us to lay the ground so the world can copy us, not that we copy the world. We are to be the head, not the tail. But because of a lack of prayer, we become like, let's copy what they're doing out there. And all of a sudden, you can't separate the church from the world. There has to be a distinction between them. And then he says here, some trust in chariots, some in horses, but we will remember the name of the Lord our God. Then he says in verse 8, they are brought down and fallen, but we are risen. Hang on to that verse. They're brought down, but you are risen. They're coming after you at work. They're brought down, but you are risen and stand upright. So God is always going to make you land on your feet. David said, you know, I have not today seen a righteous go without. God is going to fight for you. God's going to defend. In fact, there was a time in the book of um, 2 Chronicles that Jehoshaphat was in trouble. He was running for his life. He made a horrible mistake. And in that, it said that he's now going to stand and worship, and God's going to fight the battle. You know there in 2 Chronicles 20. But in that whole passage, there's a cool little verse. It says, and God said to uh, uh, um, uh, um, Jehoshaphat, listen, come over here. I want to show you something. Look down there. There's the enemy. So what God was trying to show him is that God knew where the enemy was at every moment of his life. Sometimes we don't know where the enemy's at, but God does. And if God wants to show you, he can show you. In Dothan, the same thing happened. Elijah was sleeping. The servant woke up and said, Master, we are surrounded by the Syrians. And Elijah said, Oh, God, will you help this poor guy? Open his eyes. He looked out again, and there were angels around the Syrians. You see, as the... Mountains are around Jerusalem, so the Lord is around his people. God is surrounding you. God is with you. God is for you. And God is going to see you through this. Yes, we have the chariots coming, but don't worry about it. God was able to bury the whole Egyptian army, what? By the Red Sea. So when they came in their power, on the other side in Exodus chapter 15, Miriam was singing, giving praise to God for the wonderful avenue that God destroyed the enemy. The next day, they saw bodies floating up. And God said, you're never going to see the enemy again. That's a promise of God. That's a wonderful thing. In chapter 21, only 13 verses, this is after the battle. The king shall joy in the strength, O Lord. So this is before the battle is 20. After the battle, they win. Then the king is going to rejoice in the strength of the Lord. God gave the king the strength and the battle, and the victory. And in the salvation, how great shall he rejoice. So, boy, when you're winning, it's a great day. Thou hast given him his heart's desire. Go back here to verse 4 of chapter 20. He says, grant thee according to thy own heart, and fulfill all thy counsel. Then jump over to verse, chapter 21, and look at verse 2. Thou hast given him his heart's desire, and has not withholden, and requests his lips. In other words, God has not withheld from him. If God does hold back, it's because he's more gracious in the end. So if God is not answering your prayer, it means he wants to give you more. So he has to prepare your heart. He'll never hold back. He'll never keep something from you that's good. He'll keep things away from you. But he goes on to say in verse 3, For thou preventeth him with the blessing of goodness and setteth a crown of pure gold upon his head. I believe this is what he's talking about, the children of God. He asked life of thee, and thou gave it him, even the length of days forever and ever. If you want that abundant life, God will give it. You want God to bless your life, God will give it. You want the anointing on your life, God will give it. 
He'll take your ear, anoint it. He'll take your thumb and anoint it. He'll take your toe and anoint it. He'll put gold upon your head. He'll make you a priest if that's what you want. And in fact, you are a priest. One day, you will be priests and kings. He is the Lord of many lords. He is the king of many kings. One day, you're going to judge angels. Hard to believe, isn't it? He has life. And then verse 5, his glory is great in salvation. His honor and majesty hast thou laid upon him. For thou hast made him most blessed, even forever. Thou hast made him exceeding glad with thy countenance. Two things in verse 5, verse 6. Number one, you have made me most blessed. Can you say that? God, I am blessed. Oh, I'm not blessed. I'm a Christian. And boy, I'm going through it. (laughs) Are you going to heaven? Uh Uh-huh. What about your heathen friends? They're going to hell. Are you blessed? Oh, I think so. What happens if nothing ever goes your way? For the rest of your life, but you go to heaven. Is that worth it? Yeah. You mean just eating bagels? Uh-huh, just eating bagels. Or hell and upside down in hell. And by the way, if you're lonely now, the Bible says in hell it's going to be gnashing of teeth and it's going to be separation and you're not going to see anybody for the rest of your life. You're going to burn. That's not a good thing. I can think of better things to do with my life. So you have been a blessing. Forever, thou hast made him exceeding glad. I'm joyful. For the king trust in the Lord. That's what I need to do. I need to trust in God. And thou has mercy of the Most High. He shall not be moved. Now, Kevin would be like a priest. I'd be like a prophet, king. I know my place, God's word. But it just says, listen, what does the king have to do? Every king would have to read the word of God all the way through before he started his ministry. Did they do that? No. Every king was to take down every high place. Did they do that? No. Josiah did. Hezekiah did. And they saw victory in their life. You have to be obedient to God. And it goes on to say in verse 8, Thy hand shall find out thy enemies. You're going to know. Thy right hand shall find out those that hate you. God is going to open your head. You're going to have discernment. You're going to know what's happening. You're going to sense in the last days God's going to show you. I believe that. Now, God's given me the gift of discernment. But I believe, even hanging out with Pastor Rob, God's given that gift to him now. And God is willing to give it to you. You need that gift with children, let me tell you. And you need the gift of wisdom, how to deal with them. So there was a time, I remember, Heather went to Victorville, and she said she went over here to South Bay. To, and the Lord woke me up at the middle of the night and said, she's in Victorville. I said, are you kidding me? So she came home. I said, well, how was it? Oh, the movie was great, Dad. We went right down here to the llama. I said, no, you didn't. You were in Victorville. Are you calling me a liar? I said, yes, I am. Thank God she got a ticket in Victorville. It came to me. Man, I'll tell you, I was scared, but it was like I just knew. And I beat her at every turn because I believe God helped me. So do you have that gift? No. Do you want it? Ask. You have not? Help me because you. How many of you like that to get the discernment? The key. How many would you like that to get the wisdom? Yeah. How many of you would like to have the gift of anointing? Yeah. Well, then ask God. Ask God. Well, well, I don't understand. What are you going to do? Are you going to build a wall? Then you need a hammer. You're going to cut a hole in the wall? You need a sawzall. You know, you're going to cut a piece of pipe? You need a sawzall. You're going to, what do you, whatever you need, you know, you're going to put a roof on? You need a nail gun. Whatever the need is, that's the gift I need. So I might need wisdom and knowledge, or if I'm doing accounting, I might need the gift of My brain working, not being, you know, going backwards and all that. Ask God to anoint. Thou shalt make them a fire, verse 9. It says, thou shalt make them as a fiery oven in time and anger. The Lord shall swallow them up in his wrath, and the fire shall destroy them. Their fruit shall thou destroy from the earth, and they their seed from among the children of men. In other words, the wicked are going to perish. For they intended evil against you. They imagine mischief and device which they are not able to perform. Why? Because God didn't want it. Therefore shalt thou make them turn their back when thou shalt make ready thy arrow upon the string against them. In other words, God is going to put them in a position that you let the arrow fly. It's going to hit a spot every single time. And lastly, in verse 13, Be thou exalted, God, in thy own strength. So will we sing and praise your power. Now, 
God will not give you his power. Some people say, well, yes, he will. No, he won't. He'll give you the person. And the person is Jesus Christ. And the person is the work of the Holy Spirit. Because power corrupts every single time. So the prayer you want to pray is not, God, give me power. The prayer you want to pray is, God, give me the gift of faith. And, Lord, you be magnified in my life in a greater dimension. So what you want to pray is for the Holy Spirit to be set free. For the giftings of the Holy Spirit to come inside you. So that inner man is strengthened. So you can begin to pray over your children. It sounds like a silly thing, but it looks like we're going to have to put our dog down tomorrow, the next couple, next three, four days. And it's been really a sad thing, you know. And, um, and so the other day, I was carrying it out. It has a, a liver infection. It's all toxic. And it's, it's just a cool little pug. And, and so I was walking out, and I just started praying for it. I said, God, you love animals. The lion and the lamb are going to be together. And I feel kind of foolish, but I don't feel kind of foolish, you know. I feel weird. I don't think I'm going to tell anybody, but I'm telling my whole church. So, you know, but I just felt like I need to pray for this dog, you know. And so I just laid hands. I was carrying it. And I said, God, you love animals. You know, you made them, and, you know, they, you know, they just, um, they travail because of man. But they're not going to be in the kingdom of God. But they will, will, you know, be there in the millennial, you know, the lion and lamb are going to lay together and so on and so forth. So I said, God, if it's your will, you know, as you have touched so many people, could you just touch this dog? Now, I have two options. Put it down or pray. I'd rather personally be tender and pray for anything. Pray that God would make my gas last. Have you prayed that prayer? I do. Come on. Do you, I mean, do you believe that God, I, I don't understand you guys. I mean, is he a God that multiplies? So why wouldn't he multiply your gas? I mean, if you're serving him, if you don't have all the money, and you're doing the things that are pleasing to God, why couldn't he make it stretch? I don't know. I mean, maybe I'm wrong. Maybe someone needs to correct me. Or how about maybe he could give you a break and take you to a shopping day that you need to get some stuff for the kids and everything's half price. Would you like that? Yeah. Did you ask that? Oh, no. You pay full price. Why? Why, why don't we bring God into our life? So, I know what's going to happen now. It's going to go all through the internet. Pastor, seize, pray for the animals. I don't care. I really don't care. But it would be really sweet if I could tell my wife, you know, God loves you so much, he healed your dog. That'd be a tremendous gift for her. But if he doesn't, then God's given me the strength to put the dog down myself, not hers. So I only have two options. So I chose to hold that dog. And it was kind of, went, and all of a sudden I'm praying and he licked me right in the lips. <laughs> oh, I hate that. But he's not a licker. He doesn't do that. And he just looked up at those Eyes like, I'm going to die. And I just felt like saying, you know, you have a 50-50 chance with me. What can I say? I'm, I'm, you know, but I'll give it a shot. And so I just prayed. And I don't feel ashamed. In fact, I think that's a good thing to do. Now, I wouldn't go tell a bunch of people, but I did, so go ahead. But what I'm trying to tell you is that you have not, you, you, don't, you need to bring God into your life. Father, I pray tonight. That God, we come asking that you would teach us what it is to worship you. And Father, we thank you, God, for the great gifts you've given to us. And Lord, even now, as we are going to spend a few moments in, before communion, we're going to give to you. It doesn't have to be different. It is a type of worship. It's something that we're going to give from our heart to your kingdom. We love this place. We love everything it stands for. And we thank you for the way that you have taken care of us. And God, you have used us to do that work. So would you take the offering tonight and would you multiply it and would you triple it? And God, would you just do what we can't do? 
But God, we sure ask that you would do it. Because we believe that not only are you a God that can add, but you become a God that multiplies in our lives. Give us faith, and we thank you. In Jesus' name, amen.